Um, hello everyone, good afternoon uh, and welcome to this the third and final session this week that we are putting on for you on specific topics related to the Pilot Cities program call that launched on Monday. Um, Nicole, if you can move the slides forward for me. Thank you. Okay, so um, apologies if this is a repeat for some of you who have attended earlier in the week, but just some important reminders and information. Uh, the call did launch this last Monday, the 5th of September. Um, and alongside that, we've also refreshed and um, updated the call guidelines. The call and grant management module for applications has also opened. And we've also published a range of supporting documents um, that you can find on the Pilot Cities website. Um, this is a third and final information session that we have this week. We've had one on Monday, which is a, a refresher of the, the program, its ambition and approach and some technical information as well about the system. Um, yesterday, we had a refresher on the eligibility criteria and assessment criteria. And then today we're looking at uh, the monitoring, evaluation and learning, uh, and also the impact frameworks and tables that you'll see in the application process. Um, each of these will be made available. I believe the Monday one already is. They'll be made available as recordings and with the presentations on the same website. Um, and we'll refer back to that later. Can move us on, Nicole. Thank you. Again, to reiterate, this uh, this session and this call is for both mission cities and non-mission cities. Uh, the Net Zero Cities Call for Pilot Cities is an open call under Horizon 2020, in which cities and districts in EU member states and Horizon 2020 associated countries can apply. In this particular session, we're going to cover um, creating an impact framework, logic and pathways, creating a learning and sense making process to go along with that. Uh, we'll do a guided tour of the impact framework section in the application portal. Um, and then we'll have a, some, some, that was my door, sorry about that. We'll have some uh, slides on indicators for monitoring and evaluation. And then as ever, a Q&A session for you to ask the many questions that I'm sure you'll have. Um, as with the other sessions, please do try to keep the questions that you do have relevant for this particular topic. Um, and if you do have questions that fall outside of the, 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 the information we're providing today in the discussion, do contact us directly through the um, Pilot City's email address. Some housekeeping, this session is being recorded. Uh, please do use the Q&A functionality to actually ask your questions uh, and use the chat functionality to say hello, um, which is always great. And, um, and also feel free to rename yourself and include your city um, and department in your name as well, if you want to do so. Let's go to the next slide. So just a couple of images, the Q&A function you'll see at the bottom of the screen um, as distinct from the chat one, and you can use that to post your question, but you can also access that to see what other questions are being asked and you can vote them up um, in terms of which ones you're interested in hearing the answers about as well. Um, so that we can see which ones are the most pertinent and important for you. Um, and if we do run out of time, then we'll obviously collect the remaining questions and uh, ensure that we respond to them on our frequently asked questions, which is on the website as well. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. So the, the information on these slides and in this presentation for reference only, uh, the, the Net Zero Cities Pilot Cities Programme core guidelines, which is available on the website, is the definitive official document for this call. Um, and we would encourage you to make sure that you're, you are up to date with these core guidelines, which were republished on Monday with a few minor tweaks, um, and all the associated guidance and documentation that we've made available alongside it. Next slide, thank you. And just uh, who's speaking today? Well, clearly I'm already speaking. Uh, my name's Will Wade, I'm with EIT Climate Kick. Uh, we have uh, Nikhil Chowdhury, um, who's also with Climate Kick, uh, Strategic Learning Lead. And then we have Hans Martin Neumann from the Austrian Institute of Technology um, supporting Nikhil as well. And with that, I think I now hand over to Nikhil. Trying to unmute there, happens always. Uh, thanks, Will, and, and good afternoon to all the cities. Always good to see the diversity in, in the chat thread. Uh, participants joining us uh, from all over Europe. And, and the purpose of this particular section uh, of the presentation is, of course, to look at the, the impact framework section of, of the application process. Uh, and I, I was attending the, the webinar yesterday as well, and I came across quite a many interesting 
questions on on how this framework uh, could be best filled and and probably you might have some some questions on what some of the key terms mean like you know later impacts and early impacts and what's an impact logic and so on so we thought you know it would be pertinent to actually go through each of these terms and and delve into what do they actually mean in practice so that it's not just theory but also applying it uh, in the applications and 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 sub subsequently in net zero cities uh, pilots delivery so starting with why do we need an impact logic uh, in the first place and again this <clears throat> point has been repeated multiple number of times uh, that impacts from a systemic perspective are complex uh, they're multi-dimensional and uh, Yost, one of my colleagues also presented uh, these uh, levers of change so they're, they're multiple levers of change each of them correspond to multiple dimensions uh, so so that and so are the impacts that that arise from intervening in those uh, these impacts are also non-linear meaning if we intervene in the system today it is actually Actually going to take a while until some of these impacts and co-benefits co -benefits become uh, visible and measurable, which is also the reason why we need to have this impact logic in place. And, and also because uh, also the commission has, has made this point uh, over and over again that it's not I mean, of course, yes, uh, GHG uh, productions are critical uh, and rightly so, but so are the co-benefits that come with it. And particularly, as we know, a, a lot of these co-benefits like governance, like behavior change, uh, like social impact uh, are, are quite subjective, meaning they're based on the perceptions of the citizens and communities that that where these impacts occur and the the graph that we see on on the the right uh, is actually a good indication of if we ask a, a particular question to a community we are bound to get all sorts of answers uh, you know from from brilliant and incredible to awful and terrible so it's always good to establish a baseline as to what uh, good looks like uh, in terms of a, a system's change, uh, and also build, build consensus so that we could uh, together move with collaborative action. And also looking at the right evidence. Uh, time and time again, cities have been telling us that they're drowning in data, there's a lot of reporting fatigue. So how do we bring efficiency to the, the monitoring, evaluation, learning, that is male process, so that we look for the right evidence, which can actually give us some signal uh, whether our interventions are working in practice or not. And, and lastly, and there's a, a critical point that I'll come back to again and again, not measure the change not after it happens, but while it's happening uh, is the sense of systems change because systems transformation is never complete. And, and there's also a term that you'll come across, it's called impact pathways. So you know, impact logic being the overall thinking around impacts and, and multiple elements therein. And pathways is basically trying to logically connect them together in a, in a sequential hierarchy, including uh, outcomes which, which occur over time. Uh, you know, so if, if today we are intervening in 2022, it can go until uh, 23, 25, 23, based on what uh, the impact logics timeline is. It also shows which are the most relevant outcomes because, you know, of course, there could be multiple outcomes uh, that arise from actions, but which are the most that matter uh, to us uh, for, for the pilot. Uh, and, and also trying trying to create a shared vision. There's a topic, there's a point I've touched previously. If there are multiple stakeholders, actors on the ground from, from uh, communities that, that cities constantly work with, how do we create that shared vision that all the stakeholders uh, could, could uh, get behind it? Uh, and lastly, not all the outcomes uh, and impacts can be predicted beforehand. The essence again of uh, systemic impacts is we need to start testing and learn from the tests and adapt accordingly, uh, which is why we cannot predict all the changes uh, right from the beginning, and, and which is where impact logic kind of creates a, a, a flexibility in the way we chart these pathways and move along with them. And that is what uh, the, the card right is also saying. We cannot rely on miracles. Uh, if there are gaps, we actually need to have a complete story so that we can actually visit it, revisit it later on 
as some of these impacts uh, start uh, being realized. And, and again, uh, so what are some of the key elements of this uh, so-called impact logic or theory of change? Uh, basically, it starts uh, from left to right with interventions. So these are direct actions, as in what will the pilot do uh, on the ground uh, to, to uh, intervene in the identified systems and subsystems. Early changes are some of the fundamental building blocks of how this impact, the long-term impact, is going to unfold. These happen quite early in the process, as the name suggests. So, so think about some of the governance changes, some of the, the, the stakeholder networks that need to be in place, some of the enabling policies. Uh, without which long-term impact might not uh, occur. Uh, and, and of course, later changes is something that happens once some of these preconditions or early changes are in place. And, and this middle section, the later changes, is, is uh, in most cases the crux of the, the kind of impact uh, and, and outcomes that, that an intervention aspires and, and is delivering on the ground. And finally, impacts is something that comes later, uh, much later in, in within the whole uh, impact chain, once uh, the early changes, later changes, outcomes have all uh, occurred, which then finally culminate into uh, larger impacts. And of course, one last thing is also, it's not a tool to predict 100% uh, how things are going to happen in the future. No one can do that. So it comes with it a, a set of assumptions that Okay, this we predict uh, some of the outcomes can happen, assuming X, Y, Z, things are in place. And of course, there's always risks. So it's it's good to build clarity right from the beginning as to what these, these risks are and how they could be mitigated. And, and going through this entire uh, chain of outcomes and, and impacts helps us bridge what evaluation practitioners call as this messy middle, uh, as in, you know, some 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 of the the cities that uh, that I've worked with in the past have good interventions in place. They also have the long term impacts uh, in terms of targets, like you know x uh, amount of uh, renewable energy that the city needs to uh, build until x some amount of time. But but the how is 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 sometimes they need help with, and there's exactly what the frameworks that we're talking about today are, are here to, to do. Uh, they'll help uh, cities come up with their strategic objectives so that they can move from interventions uh, to these impacts, and also combine uh, some of the, the traditional planning and measurement uh, approaches, which look at final impacts exposed once they've happened, uh, but also uh, align with them uh, some of the measurement and learning tools and processes which are actually measuring these uh, intermediate outcomes and not just the final ones. And there's a diagram that Will had also shared yesterday, so which uh, also forms the, forms the basis of uh, Net Zero Cities uh, theory of change. So we have been trying to frame our own theory how we'll support cities uh, in, in their climate neutrality journeys. Uh, and quickly to give an overview of, you know, we have talked about this before in one of the webinars as well, but uh, for those or those of the participants who are new to this, uh, it starts from left and right, left to right, with some of the, the key emission domains. Again, these are included in the guidebook uh, based on the input kit. Uh, and, and of course, with that coupled are the systemic levers, which basically are is the connective tissue between multiple emission domains that we need to uh, act within simultaneously, all of which forms you know, the, the cities, the, the, port, the so-called portfolio uh, that we've referred to multiple number of times, which then leads to early changes, probably in the first couple of years, uh, which then, as I said, lead to later changes and, and also uh, the direct and co benefits uh, that will be accrued along the way. Uh, and, and the bottom part being, how do we actually monitor and, and measure some of these uh, changes based on uh, some of the existing protocols and, and, and digital tools and interfaces and platforms that you might be familiar with? So in essence, interventions is our actions, uh, what the pilot will do, i.e. activities. What will the pilot achieve or change uh, would be the early changes or later outcomes. What are those? At, at the end of the cycle of these, uh, these two years, what are those future conditions that the pilot has set? Hopefully something that transcends not just the project duration, 
but goes on for a long uh, timeline, hopefully until 2030, until when the mission uh, is achieved. And finally, the bottom part being, how is the pilot's uh, progress being measured, not just uh, quantitatively, but also qualitatively using these continuous sense making and learning processes. Uh, and we thought uh, it would be good to also give an example from this net zero cities theory of change that I talked about uh, in terms of uh, how cities could start approaching looking at these levers to 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 chart their impacts. So look at let's look at let's consider the example of one city and a disclaimer: there's not the solution. There's just uh, an an inspiration. An inspiration if a, uh, if a city chooses to use a particular lever, these are some of the indications uh, that these are the kind of impacts that could unfold. So let's think. Uh, Nikhil, sorry, yeah. can I just pause you there a second sure. before you jump into this very sure. detailed and great image? Um, I'm just very conscious that we have quite a lot of um, people from, from different um, countries and language backgrounds, and um, maybe it'd be good to slow down a little bit just to make sure everyone's keeping up with um, the detail and the, the insights that we're gathering from this. Sure, okay, thanks Thanks for that reminder. Uh, so what we're looking here is, let's let's take an example of a, of a city which chooses three emission domains. So mobility, uh, energy, and electricity. So let's, uh, for the sake of argument, uh, let's say it's it's a direct retrofit project uh, which is looking at technology and infrastructure as as one of its uh, levers of change. So some of the early changes uh, that could could result from this lever are, of course, uh, trying to identify what are those systems and subsystems that cities would like to intervene in, even with energy, electricity, and mobility. There are so many technological systems out there. So which are the ones that the city is choosing under their intervention uh, to, to act upon? Of course, uh, em the emission gap analysis will also give an indication as to where uh, some of these interventions need to occur. So looking at the first, uh, these two columns in the middle, which say early outcomes are of course, uh, some of the, 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 the understanding of barriers and uh, enablers of each of the solutions need to be known uh, for them to be actually applied uh, in a particular context. It's also important to identify who are the users uh, of these uh, technologies. It's it's critical to also know which are some of these physical spaces or places where these technologies uh, could be tested. So these could be test beds or sites where these technologies could be deployed. And and of course, you know, if there needs to be a breakthrough solutions or new technologies developed uh, where there are no set uh, investment cases or business models or there is a need for additional capital, uh, the, the cities or actors on the ground will actually need to come up with why uh, financiers would be interested uh, in investing in, in these technologies, which hopefully leads to new forms of multi-stakeholder collaborations and prototyping of a minimum of viable product if it's a breakthrough technology. Looking at some of the later outcomes, once you know the pilot actually starts deploying some of these solutions, uh, so technologies are hopefully by then successfully accepted and, and adopted by the communities. Hopefully, multiple technologies come together so that there's improved integration of customized solutions. So it's not just an off-shelf product, but solutions are actually customized uh, in collaboration with companies. And by, by testing some of these solutions on the ground, uh, there's new monitoring data and insights that are unlocked, which in turn creates, uh, which could be then fed, fed back by the city uh, into their decision making or, or uh, new regulations or new procurement models, which could eventually help scale some of these technologies up. And, and finally, going through the entire process, there's also skill building for some of the solution providers but also increase capabilities for the city uh, based on how they're engaging with the users and with the solution providers. Uh, hopefully the new value chains and higher demand for these integrated solutions and not just one solution, but a whole bundle of it in turn uh, results in massive uh, GHG reductions and the co-benefits come uh, with, with that. 
So that's again one example of 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 using one lever for three mission domains. There, there's a second example that we could also look at. So let's say in the same pilot pilot initiative, uh, the city also chooses a second lever uh, of social innovation. Now let's look at like what are some of those uh, early changes and later on outcomes that can accrue uh, using this particular lever. So let's assume the city acknowledges that social innovation uh, is critical. Uh, it creates sufficient uh, resources and, and there's a team in place to actually map out which are the social innovation initiatives which exist on the ground. Uh, once that is done, the city also undertakes rapid prototyping and, and designing, redesigning of some of these services uh, that, that could be offered to the communities that are identified on the ground, which in turn leads to new forms of public private community collaborations uh, in along with it. Uh, the city also establishes uh, social innovation accelerators, which then also generate social entrepreneurship and business creation, which uh, in turn creates a fertile ground for some of these uh, services to be tested. In turn, uh, also improving the citizen participation so that there's more and more communities and citizens which are directly involved uh, in the citizen uh, in the city's climate action. Uh, so once let's assume this happens in the first uh, two years, uh, we move to year three and four, where we see some of the the actual implementation of these services within these uh, communities that are identified also create new capabilities for the cities as to what social innovation means in a particular context for this city. And also, how could public sector funding be utilized or leveraged to then create additional investments in terms of uh, philanthropic capital or private finance uh, and so on. Some of the social businesses or social ventures then start creating uh, local jobs, uh, leading to further increased investments. Learning from these solutions also leads or, or starts informing certain policies from the city side, uh, because of which some of the changes in the communities become visible in terms of uh, the actual built environment or physical space starts transforming because of the implementation on site, which then leads to a range of impacts and co-benefits, which uh, we've listed here. I won't go through all of them, but the point being, of course, there is environmental impacts like you know, GHG reduction, air quality improvement, uh, urban greening, but there's also a host of qualitative co-benefits like better governance or a distributed model of governance, which is shared by the city and, and within communities, uh, but also an improved uh, sense of belonging, social well-being uh, and inclusion. Again, all social impacts, qualitative, which need to be rigorously measured with, with the actors on the ground. And finally, also scaling scaling up of some of these uh, social innovation solutions beyond the existing phase. And until now, we have uh, considered single levers of change. Like for example, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about social innovation and, and in, uh, technology. But the essence again of a pilot is this multi lever, multi emission domains intervention uh, that we've talked about previously. So the the idea here is also how some of these multiple impacts start coming together to form new combinations. So it's not just the impacts uh, that matter in themselves, but how could we combine these, these multiple impacts uh, into what you uh, see on the screen. So again, like, I won't talk through the entire uh, outcomes chain here, but what you can see is uh, I've color, color coded each of these levers separately. So you can start uh, seeing some patterns start to emerge where certain impacts start coming together uh, quite nicely in terms of, so let's pick one example. For example, participation and new forms of uh, engagement is something that is common across. So that could be cl cl clubbed together as new collaborations. Again, there's multiple uh, outcomes focused on skills and capabilities, which could be clubbed together. Along the way, while actually conducting this exercise, the city may realize that there is one lever which was missing previously, which was finance and funding, which could be introduced here into, into this mix, which finally creates what you see on the screen is, is a fully formed impact framework, uh, with, which takes into consideration 
multiple emission domains that you see listed here. Uh, there are multiple levers of change, which could be tagged for each of the, the, the impacts. And you have a nice uh, separation between early outcomes uh, as a result of the interventions, the beginning, later outcomes uh, and impacts and co-benefits all together in a single frame. So hopefully that was a, a good overview of what are some of the expectations in filling this impact framework. Of course, you know, it will take some rounds, some iterations to actually nail it down, which is also where some of the internal discussions and co-creations will be important, uh, but also some of the, the guiding questions which are posted here, I won't go through all of them, but feel free to refer to these once you actually start creating these impact frameworks of your own. And finally, there's there's also uh, these guiding questions that wait, uh, these are the starting points. And then once you've actually made some progress, you can actually refer to some of what I'm sh showing on the screen, just as an internal checklist, checklist for you to help uh, with filling your own uh, impact framework sections. So let me pause there. I know I've been speaking for a really long time. Uh, so let's see if there are any questions. Um, I feel I was uh, supposed to help you with the questions, but there's only one, so I think you can take it. <laughs> um, can you see it? Are there any real cases for these approaches? Absolutely. So, so this is is quite uh, well established in the international development sphere. Uh, so that's one. And second, uh, philanthropic capital, whenever their funders uh, which are choosing uh, their, their grantees or recipients, they, they generally ask uh, for a theory of change. And of course, uh, this also comes from a traditional log frame methodology, which, which was quite a mechanical exercise that, you know, put your outputs and outcomes and impacts and, and, and da, 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 da. Uh, but what we are, so the, within the evaluation practitioners community, uh, slowly that log frame has now moved to a theory of change, which was which is much more flexible uh, in, in the sense it does not ask you the exact uh, outputs right at the beginning, but have a, a generalized uh, impact logic, which which is open to interpretations, to change, to revisions, based on the on the assumptions and risks uh, that, that the city pursues. And of course, you know, we, we, uh, there, you know, some other test uh, cases and examples that you know perhaps we could include as as a part of the resources that would be shared with cities. There's also another question, um, more of an ask, but to show your second last slide again. So hopefully that's what I'm showing right that? now. Hopefully, oh, right, second last. Maybe, maybe there's a question about this slide. Um, Or maybe let's come back to the questions uh, later on. Perhaps uh, the participant could ask uh, a specific question if they had any. But in the interest of time, uh, I would suggest let's move on. No open questions. That's good. So uh, now coming to the second part of uh, this presentation, uh, which which also is relevant. Uh, so I've been told there's a particular section in the application process uh, where uh, the, the learning process also needs to be uh, explained and outlined by the city. So hopefully what I'm about to, to talk about gives uh, some indication of uh, what, what uh, this learning process uh, which also is is uh, with, which directly aligns with systems change systems transformation initiatives uh, looks like. Uh, trying to click the slides through, yeah. So again, you know, starting with intro, what do we mean by strategic learning anyway? Because again, learning is is quite a general term. Uh, so for the sake of net zero cities, what we mean by learning or strategic learning rather is is knowledge of what what are the which are the solutions that are actually working in practice, uh, what are their contexts, 
who are their beneficiaries and why. So the why is pretty key uh, to, to responding to, to why a particular solution works in the field. Uh, and, and the knowledge should hopefully support direct and rapid course correction, meaning it's not learning and knowledge for knowledge sake, as in it's not a research project, but the insights and, and knowledge and, and learnings that are unlocked from interventions uh, should always feed uh, into the decision making uh, around investments, around policy making, around project management, uh, etc., uh, which is again called actionable insights instead of just insights. Uh, part of it also has to do with building uh, core capabilities and capacities for all stakeholders. So the learning processes and learning activities supports it. Uh, the learning also translates at what is that uh, base evidence base uh, that cities could build uh, in terms of uh, what their success looks like, but also enable knowledge sharing within other cities within the network and Net Zero Cities as a platform is a, is a terrific place to do that. Uh, but importantly, not just learn from success stories, but also uh, learn in a safe space with, which allows talking about failures and barriers uh, and the not so positive things uh, which are critical uh, for the success of this initiative. And, and also there would be something we call as sense-making uh, cycles and learning goals, which I'll come through in a moment. Uh, but also the way learning dif differs from traditional reporting uh, is also, as a, and there's something that I've said previously, so reporting does not happen once implementation is complete uh, because the target is always shifting or the targets are long-term. So we cannot rely on some models that have worked in the last 10, 20 years, and we need to come up with uh, new methods and new processes. Uh, and we are, when we are looking at complex systems, uh, for example, uh, net zero pilot initiatives, uh, which are aiming for that green flag, which are some, some of the boldest missions uh, in, in Europe, uh, there's instead of a straight path to, to success, like the previous diagram, there's actually a, a, it's like cycling through the woods. So there'll be valleys, uh, there'll be forests, uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be a lot of barriers along the way. So the only uh, path towards this goal uh, is trying to almost elevate a hot air balloon to see what the landscape looks like, where, where have we reached and, and look at what matters, uh, what's possible and what is, which basically means uh, what is the data telling us and in terms of what's going on currently in our intervention? What does this mean uh, for future actions uh, and what's possible in terms of now what do we do next, so next actions? And, and each of these uh, learning loops, as we, call, we, as we call them, are hoped uh, to unlock these uh, strategic insights. So insights meaning a narrative that, that uh, tries, tries to capture a particular observation, which is both relevant and actionable. So in essence, uh, sense-making is a structured social process of uh, constantly observing, reflecting, stock taking, uh, and finding patterns as to where a, a particular uh, project or initiative is in terms of it, its progress and where does it need to go. From there, that point on, uh, it is again based on key learning inquiries or learning questions. So, so it's it's quite structured in the kind of uh, conversations uh, and insights it's hoping to unlock. It is periodic, so that it's not just have it once and then forget about it, but actually keep doing it over and over again and keeping keep reframing our initial uh, assumptions and logics, uh, but also look at. Oh, consider uh, a lot of the co-creation methods as we call them, and there are multiple uh, co-creation methods. I won't go through all of them, uh, but but it, it, uh, it's, it's a mode for multiple cities or actors to come together and critically reflect on, on what the strategy needs to be. And that is how this relevance gap hopefully uh, is, is, is closed as the city progresses. Uh, and again, you know, it's, it's, it, it looks at both qualitative and quantitative evidence, and, and we all know that we need both of them. You know, an example of a, a doctor looking at all of the diagnostic uh, 
features from, from a patient. So it's speaking to them uh, and getting to know their history uh, to these more quantitative steps, which then comes together in the form a, of a holistic uh, diagnostic, which is also called mixed methods. Uh, and also avoid this McNamara policy. Uh, again, if you Google this term, you'll understand that McNam McNamara was uh, the Secretary of Defense for the US uh, for the Vietnam War, uh, always believed that the US would win purely based on numbers, but we all know how history turned out to be. Uh, and that's a good uh, indication of not just relying on objective uh, quantitative data, uh, which is no doubt important, but also couple it with qualitative uh, and anecdotal evidence. Uh, and, and the theory of change or impact logic that I showed previously uh, also helps us to do that in the sense uh, each of the impacts could be uh, translated into a particular learning goal or learning plan uh, based on which uh, it helps us both monitoring and evaluation activities, uh, but also, as I said, as I explained, uh, reflection and sense making, uh, which then unlocks both internal knowledge, which could then be fed back into the impact logic to refine it, uh, to reframe it, but also unlock learning for a wider audience so that uh, the learning is always connected with decision making and external uh, communication. Uh, and again, uh, when we bring both of these uh, quantitative and qualitative processes uh, together. We are not just looking uh, for data to prove that we are succeeding, but actually signal process so that we can feed those insights uh, back uh, into our practice. So it's not just data and learning for reporting sake for an external funder, but actually for the city to improve, uh, trying to, 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 to work better, uh, to move towards the, the, the pilot goals. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, there's, there will be ample support that will be provided by the consortium in terms of these learning processes. Uh, and what does it mean in practice? So if you, if you look at the uh, traditional project cycle, which moves from design to mobilization to delivery, and once delivery has happened, that is when the learning and adaptation happens. So instead of that, we are trying to do these constant learning loops. So these green loops uh, that you see, each of them correspond to a particular learning activity where cities could come together and based on their impact logic, actually start uh, sharing uh, and, and critically looking at their progress, uh, which helps you know, data uh, bringing a lot of the quantitative, even quantitative data actually into practice, uh, which then unlocks actionable insights, which informs uh, the portfolio implementation uh, and, and the city's own uh, Mail processes, which hopefully build uh, in, an evidence base that can signal what works, what not, not just for the city, but actually share that knowledge across a wider network of cities. Uh, and last, lastly, there's there's also a the, the Net Zero Cities platform where we are planning to uh, bring a lot of these learn, learning services to bear, uh, including you know creating tailor made and customized learning journeys based on multiple tools, and and of course uploading a lot of the content in terms of training videos and case studies and 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 so on, but also create uh, active knowledge exchange, not just passive consumption of material. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. I know I've, I've definitely over uh, overshot my my duration. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. There are some. Um, if you want me, I can read them for you. No, I can. I can yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. Them Go open. ahead. So, so the multilever framework. So we. Of course, you know this recording and the presentation will be available. Uh, as, 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 I, as I said, uh, the slide deck that we will share will be an updated version of it. So it will also have some additional uh, slides that will talk more about the approach. Uh, and of course, we'll also hyperlink a lot of the, the other external uh, reports and, and guidebooks that should help uh, the city uh, grasp these. Just, just to add to that as well, Nikhil, yeah. And particularly around the detail in the portal, we'll be sharing that in a minute as to where you can include relevant information that, that is hopefully a, the right level of information for you to be able to detail out the framework.
indeed. Uh, I'm looking at some of the other questions, and it seems uh, it's about the, the project, uh, pilot project itself, uh, than, than the mill aspect. So I will, let's, let's probably take that uh, later. Mm. I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking at some, some interesting uh, or useful questions rather. Uh, and I think I'm not spotting any at this point. But there's two questions in there. There's one that I think it's, it would certainly be useful for us to address. Um, the question is uh, the impact can be disruptive in upsetting incumbents like that of cable networks and satellite networks by in internet protocol based OTT Netflix. Will this pilot project look for that level as well? And the example given is um, energy, electricity, and other domains are governed and operated ineffectively by monopolistic organizations in any city. I think when you're saying that that's not necessarily a male question, I think you're probably right there. Um, I think it's probably worth just repeating something uh, that came up yesterday, um, is that the, the pilot activity should focus on the barriers that the city has to change and um, and how they can, how you can test and innovate and experiment, and how to overcome those, um, rather than just being disruptive and upsetting for the sake of that. And I'm sure that's not the point that was being made, but it really is. Um, that's why there's an emphasis in the call on really taking the time to understand the barriers and then the potential intervention points to um, overcome some of those barriers um, where possible. And of course, um, in that particular example, I, I would imagine that. Engagement with stakeholders uh, uh, is a is a critically important part of that process. So that would be something that would be a core cool part of the activity, I assume. And there's there's uh, an additional question on uh, would examples be available uh, for sure. So as I said, you know they would be uh, within the slide deck. We would try and include probably a reference section where we will hyperlink some of these external reports uh, and so on. Uh, which could be used as a reference. Uh, and of course, my colleague Hans Martin will also touch upon uh, the specific indicators and, and how we we'll support cities uh, in selecting them. So with that, I think this would be a good time to hand, hand the, the floor over to you, Will, and thanks everyone. Thanks, Nico. I'm just going to do a quick scene change and I'll share my screen. It should be loading. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to do a very uh, brief guided tour of um, filling in the impact framework, um, bearing in mind all of the, the rich information and, and guidance that Nikhil has just provided um, more broadly. Um, but a few points just beforehand. I can get this to work. Okay. Yeah. So before we take uh, a tour of the education systems impact framework, a few a few points I wanted to make. Um, as you've seen from from the, the various diagrams and information that Nikhil has shared, this is very it is very complex and really thinking through how you want to put together a um, a theory of change or impact logic and pathway um, is um, the system isn't going to be able to fully capture all of the nuances in that. So I want you to try and think about this, uh, the impact framework in the system is your canvas for illustrating the pathway or your, your impact pathway. Um, and then once you have your canvas sketched out, then filling in the detailed brushwork um, as you in, uh, of what you intend to measure and then how um, is the sort of next stage there. And then uh, in order to drive the activities forward and to drive towards the, the impact that you, you anticipate and that you want to have, what will you target um, in the time of the pilot activities to both test this and then learn from that journey itself? Um, a proviso, though, is that to please always bear in mind the assessment criteria. After all, this is a call for, call for applications, so do refer back to the core guidelines for what is ultimately going to be assessed in, in your impact logic and theory of change. And, uh, and also the following selection, um, that we, will, we will be working with those selected um, pilot cities to refine the impact logic and the theory of change, um, and also looking at how you measure progress, impact and outcomes as well. Okay, so I'll flip over to the system now. 
So just as a reminder, the impact framework is uh, this sixth tab across from the top here. There is a little bit of guidance at the top just to, to help you with filling this out. And um, what we have in here at the moment is um, a, a representation of part of one of Nikhil's frameworks that he, that he showed, um, actually the, the multi-lever one. Um, so if I show here um, one that I've already entered, and then I'll show you how to enter elements to it, um, you can expand it out by pressing the arrow button there. It's normally already expanded. And this first level here, you can see in the second column, it says um, impact logic. And so this first level here is the intervention. And we've also tagged against that the emissions domains to which this intervention relates and the levers that it will be using effectively. Thereafter, you can start nesting under the, the impact logic of intervention, the different elements of the theory of changes as Nicole has shown with the, with the various diagrams. So you can see here, you can then indicate early outcomes, one to two years. You can indicate later outcomes, three to four years. And you can nest them one on top of the other, depending on whether something comes first or, or later, even if it still is an early outcome. Um, and then also after that, you can then um, add in direct indirect impacts or co-benefits, and then also uh, longer term impacts as well. So the reason why I said before to ensure to, to really think about this as your canvas and your place to, to, to illustrate the theory of change is that this system and this logic um, is based on a log frame. And it doesn't have the, the full flexibility to be able to do all of the beautiful links between all the different elements um, that, that were shown in the examples. But it really is a place for you to try and convey to, to us and to the, um, the experts what your thinking is around those interventions and how they will lead over time and different stages to the outcomes and changes that you wish to see eventually leading to impact. Um, for the remaining columns here, you'll see that there is um, you will input a proposal indicator, a proposed indicator for definition. Uh, sorry, a proposed indicator definition. So what is the indicator, basically? Then you'll add some information about how to measure progress there. Um, and then also what the expected target is for the lifetime of the pilot activities over the two years. Um, so that's just showing you a pre-populated one. Um, and I'll show you quickly now how you can actually add elements as well. So I've created um, a second intervention point here, which is technologies developed and service design. Um, and I'm going to add some elements to this. Uh, the first thing to do actually to note actually is when you add this, you will select intervention from a list. So I'll just show that. So first question is which part of the impact logic is this element relating to? And intervention is the place to start because then you've messed the remaining ones underneath it. Once you've input an intervention, you see I have one here, you can then click into that and add a little bit more information to it. So for example, you can select the levers, um, which are most relevant to it, and the emissions domains um, uh, that, that it will be focusing on. Um, just to note here that you don't need to provide any information around indicated definitions, um, expected target through the life of the project, or how you will measure the progress, um, because uh, this is the intervention rather than the actual um, outcomes and uh, impacts that, that would be measured. So adding an element, I've, I've added the intervention there, and then I want to indicate something that is an earlier outcome. So I select there and I give it a title. And then a definition. So there was the question around um, the level of detail to add in this framework. So you can add a definition of what that outcome is. What, what does it look like? What, is, what does it mean when it's achieved? Um, and then you would provide the further information around the, the definition of the indicator, how the indicator will be measured and how progress will be measured and then the target that is expect, expected for this particular indicator over the lifetime of the activities. Um, so I would add some text in there. And then this is where the, nest, the nesting logic comes in to make the, the uh, impact framework illustrative. So you search for a parent element, and for this one it's the technologies. Uh, And it should have nested under that particular intervention point. Uh, uh, if this does happen and it doesn't add it to, then you can always edit it afterwards using the 
edit button there. Uh, it's not that one. And then find the intervention. There we go, technologies development and service design. So when I save that and refresh the table, to make it easier to see, you can collapse that and you can see I've added under technology development and service design an early outcome here. And then it's just a, a, effectively a process of repeating this at the different levels that you want to add, associating it to the um, to a parent outcome. So you can see the logic as it cascades. Um, in, in the cases in which in the more complicated um, multi-lever frameworks where multiple interventions might lead to the same longer term impacts, um, as a system doesn't allow you to cross reference, then just use, re repeat the impact again. Um, so it's clear that this, this particular intervention leads to that impact out or outcome um, as well as another intervention at the same time. Okay, uh, so just a couple of clarifying points to finish up with the demo. Um, interventions here refer to the activities that you intend to undertake that would substantively lead to the intended outcomes and impacts. So it's not, in, not a case of including every activity the pilot is doing, but pulling out of your, your activities, which are the ones that are going to lead to um, as a combination or individually lead to substantive outcomes and impact. Um, and then just to reiterate again, I know I keep saying it, but the important thing is here to use this impact framework um, to illustrate your impact logic and, and the pathway. Um, and again, to remind you that you should always be thinking about the assessment criteria and the core guidelines, as this is ultimately where your proposal will be assessed. Uh, and then I'll take any questions on the short demo there. There's only one comment, so maybe we can do that. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that, Terry. Your, your microphone wasn't. Yeah, sorry, I said it's only one comment. If you want, I can read it for you. Um, no, no, I can. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the question is so, in addition to focusing on the barriers, we need to figure out the solutions and indicators as well, and basically everything. Um, so in the proposal itself, we, what we want to see is your thinking around um, thinking and understanding around what are the barriers that your city has in the particular emissions domains and profiles that you're focusing on for the pilot. So that's a really important part. And then the, the assessment criteria for the solutions is, is, um, is more about, it, as it's titled, orienting to, to solutions. So what solutions and intervention points do you see uh, as, um, as being ones that are right to explore, trying to overcome those barriers. As with the, the impact framework and with various other things, when we select the pilots, we will be working with you to, to sort of um, have a look at what it is you propose, what your activities you were intending and the solutions that you were thinking about. And we work with you to identify them and see whether they are the right ones or whether there are, are alternative ones as well. It's the same for the indicators. This, this is very much about you presenting towards your thinking and your understanding and, and where and where you think both the interventions are and then how you would intend to measure progress against them. But we would work with you to refine that impact model and that impact framework. And, uh, and as Nikhil said before, there is support available um, for the selected pilots, but also uh, it's certainly on the learning and sense making, but also in the immediate time after we've selected the pilots, we'll be working with you to refine those things as well. See any of the questions and Nicola, perhaps we'll pass back to you. Oh, there is another one. Uh, okay, so uh, the slides and recordings um, for the two previous webinars are on the Net Zero Cities website under the page Call for Pilots. They're, they'll all be uploaded there. Um, uh, the presentation decks and the videos. Um, and a question around in the early information sessions, we said that you do not need to have the solutions. So has it changed? 
Uh, it's always been the case that there are questions around, as has been in the in the draft core guidelines, what your um, anticipated intervention points and solutions might be. But it's not to say that the solutions that you submit are the ones that you will absolutely need to take forward or that you already have them lined up um, and have suppliers and things like that. It's more about your thinking and orientation. And then we work with you to design those um, and design the pilot activities moving forward. Uh, if we see other parental outcomes, then in the menu will there be a way, an opportunity to define some ourselves. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question. Um, so perhaps maybe we can ask Mikhail to, to unmute, but I think what I showed, um, everything you put into the framework is, is yours to define yourself. There are no preloaded um, outcomes or, or impacts or interventions in there. So when you go into the framework, you very much start from scratch, but I'm not sure if that answers the question. Assume there's not a follow up from the car, then, then maybe it has. Yes, no, the, the, the ones that you saw now aren't preloaded and you're not stuck with a, a catalog um, to select from. It's very much your thinking and how you want to put it together. I'll pass back to you then, Nicola, I'll just on share. So let me share the, the presentation from my system and let me invite uh, my colleague Hans Martin Neumann uh, to then continue with the presentation now, sharing the screen. Here we go. Hopefully you can yeah. see the slide deck now. Uh, I can see that, yeah. Perfect. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, give you uh, a brief overview over how we will support the monitoring um, and the reporting on the, uh, on the pilot, uh, pilots and all the activities related to them uh, by a, uh, an indicator system that we are currently developing. Uh, next slide, please. So our starting point for this uh, indicator system is the theory of change that uh, my colleague uh, Nikhil has just presented. And um, well, in the end, uh, I think the theory of change shows uh, what the pilot should achieve. Of course, as we are talking about climate neutrality, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is, is a very important topic. So this is here reflected in the theory of change uh, by the impact domains that help uh, to describe uh, the current status of the greenhouse gas emissions emerging from the from the pilot site, um, and it will also help to assess then the the delta between uh, well what you can observe before the intervention after the intervention uh, being the the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is uh, well also shown on the right hand side of the theory of change, uh, and it's called here direct uh, direct impacts. So this is basically the saving in greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. Um, and now the question is how to quantify this. You know? And uh, of course, you have to look at all the subdomains of this. So we have emissions from, from energy systems. Uh, you have emissions from, uh, or from, from, circ from treating uh, well, from waste pre treatment. You, know? you have uh, also uh, the question on how to uh, potentially uh, absorb carbon by planting trees by using nature-based solutions. This needs to be covered. You have uh, industry uh, that uh, leads to emissions of greenhouse gas emissions, and you have the stationary environment, meaning basically buildings um, that uh, are relevant here, and also uh, which is for reasons I do not understand completely are not shown. Uh, of course, you also have to think about mobility because you have um, emissions from from the mobility sector that need to be covered. So for all of these subdomains, uh, we will provide uh, indicators uh, that help you to assess the impact of your solution uh, precisely. Uh, we will not reinvent these indicators. They are already, already existing. They are exhaustively used, for example, for reporting on, on the CDP system. They're used for reporting on, on my covenant. 
so uh, we will uh, create as much as much synergies as possible with these systems in order to avoid double work and to make the reporting for you as easy as possible. Next slide, please. Um, then uh, we also have something that we call indirect impacts. Uh, this is very important. The indirect impacts are the co-benefits. So what is a co-benefit? Uh, cities are aiming at climate neutrality, not only because they, they want to do something good for climate, but also because they want to use it as a lever uh, for, for uh, social change, for improving the living conditions in the cities, for making the city more attractive, for making the city more competitive, and so on. Uh, this is all fair and it's all natural. Um, uh, and uh, we would also like to get a better understanding of what these co-benefits actually are uh, in the monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Of course, not every city goes for every co-benefit. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have tried to um, somehow group the different co-benefits uh, in a conceptual exercise in, in, in one of the work packages of the Net Zero Cities project. And we came in the end uh, to these subcategories. Uh, so we have climate change adaptation, meaning some of the solutions that you will implement will not only uh, help to avoid greenhouse gas emissions, but they might also help to deal with the unavoidable impacts of climate change. For example, if you think about greening, no, uh, you will also have, if you foresee nature-based solutions, they might absorb some carbon, but on the, on the same, side, on the same uh, hand, they also will uh, reduce, uh, I would say, auto, or make the auto climate more uh, attractive. Uh, it will make also, and, and, and therefore it's a contribution to climate change adaptation. We have health impacts. You know? If you think, for example, about climate-friendly mobility, uh, that might entail a high share of, of active mobility. This also has health co-benefits. You have social co-benefits. Uh, you might, uh, and uh, if you go back, please, to the previous slide, um, we have impacts regarding the resource efficiency. If you, if you have a more efficient energy system, you might not only uh, save carbon emissions, but you will also save uh, scarce resources. We have economic co-benefits uh, in terms of making city more attractive, more, co more competitive, uh, and you have biodiversity impacts, again, related, for example, to nature-based solutions. Of course, not each of the city will address by their pilot all of the co-benefits. So therefore, the co-benefit uh, monitoring and reporting is from our point of view, uh, well, not fully optional, but it will be like a menu where you can choose which categories are relevant for you. And we will give you some side guidance on how to do this, but in the end, it is your decision. Uh, and in the reporting that uh, was just shown uh, by, by my colleagues, uh, by, by Will in particular, that this will be reflected. We will offer some indicators that you can use. You want to quantify these co-benefits, but it's up to you to decide which ones you will use. Okay, next slide, please. Um, uh, and then we have also something that is more, uh, is very important as a, I would say, as a lever for change. Uh, these are the all the kind of different, I would say, preconditions that you need to uh, fulfill, that you need to meet in order to become climate neutral in the end. We all know this is not something that can be done by pushing a button or by taking one county, uh, well, well, council resolution, but uh, several, uh, I would say, requirements need to be fulfilled. You have to work on, for example, governance of qualities and social innovation. You will also need to raise uh, new funding and private capital in order to make it happen. And you also should think about, uh, well, uh, growing learning and capabilities. Uh, and this is something that, uh, as it was also described in the two previous uh, conversations, we would also like to, uh, to, to uh, monitor together with you. Um, uh, I think more in a qualitative way, because this is uh, very much related to activities that are uh, carried out within the pilots and uh, still they should be documented. And uh, if you document them, um, this can be done in a qualitative way, but also partially, it's always good to have numbers in a quantitative way. Also here, we will uh, provide a, a toolbox, an indicator toolbox that will help you to describe the impacts that you consider relevant and it is your decision, uh, which of them you consider uh, the most relevant and this one you will report. Next slide, please. Uh, this gives you just some indications, for example, for finance and funding. This is something that will be covered, I would say, in term, indeed a bit more, uh, uh, more in detail because this is something that you need to uh, provide for, for, for every pilot. You need to know how this will be financed. Uh, we have uh, dimensions like capital investment, uh, private to public uh, ca capital share, um, uh, carbon uh, and, and the uh, carbon emissions by capital invested. So these are just some, 
some indicators that uh, help you to show the impact of the, the finance and the funding raised. Uh, on the social innovation, uh, we have skills and capacity building, for example, the public administration. We have empowerment and inclusion of, of citizens. We have changes in regulation uh, and we have uh, systemic innovation at the bigger picture. For the governance innovation, it's basically very similar. No? You will observe change in the governance structure or you will maybe define this as a goal and then you will monitor whether you achieved it or not. Uh, the same applies to government's principles and uh, governance processes. And um, uh, the same, well, also for, for learning the capabilities, we've created some criteria that will help you to report on, on what you're doing. Um, not included yet are the uh, technology, uh, I would say, dimensions. This will be added at a later stage. We're just discussing this still with the work package that response, is responsible for it. Next slide, please. So this is basically, these are the dimensions of monitoring that uh, uh, we will support you um, uh, to, to report on in the pilot monitoring, and we will do this by providing uh, tools and methods how to report properly. You've just seen this portal where data can be uploaded, and we will also uh, provide you an inventory uh, of, of indicators that you can use um, uh, for, for what you consider useful. I would expect that for the greenhouse gas emissions, I think all of you will have a rather, I would say, comprehensive monitoring in place because that's a requirement of the mission uh, for the co-benefits and for the levers. It is basically up to you what you want to report on, but we will give you a hand and help you to do this in a good way. Next slide, please. Um, so now the question is, how will this monitoring evaluation and, uh, and uh, learning actually being implemented? How do you actually, what should you do in order to be able in the end to have a, a, a report on the impact? First of all, you need to define the scope. No, I've already said uh, not every pilot will do everything. I assume that all pilots will save greenhouse gas emissions. But regarding the co-benefits, my some uh, maybe one pilot has more does more on climate change adaptation, while another one does more on um, uh, on uh, from, I don't know doing something attractive for the economy. This you need to decide at the very beginning because uh, you will only. Uh, then, of course, collect data for those fields that are relevant for you. No? And we don't, will not push you to do everything. It is very important for you to know what you want to go for, and then uh, we can define the scope, or you can define the scope. Um, after you've defined the scope, it's important to set objectives. I think that will be done for the pilots uh, already on the way to the application, or there will be some indicators provided in the in the uh, proposal that will be submitted. Uh, but also later on, once you start the implementation, you will define for yourself and also course, for, for net zero cities and for the European Commission, some key performance indicators. And you will not only define the indicators, but you will define, OK, what you want to actually achieve. Yeah. Um, step two and step three are somehow inter, interlinked. Step two defines more what you, in a qualitative way, want to uh, um, uh, uh, identify what you want to reach. And in step three, the question is then, OK, if, I, uh, if I'm uh, clear on the objective, how can I uh, measure my progress and this is the selection, selection of the indicators? Once you have selected indicators, uh, well, what do you do? Well, you have to identify what the data should come from that helps you to calculate. This will be uh, for some, I would say, for some monitoring dimensions easier than for others. Um, in particular, when it comes to greenhouse gas emission, you have a technical implementation, you will have some, at least some planning data. You might have also later some data from operations that will help you to assess the uh, your progress in a quantitative way for other dimensions, in particular for the levers, I think it will be more qualitative. Also, this is something that I think needs to be defined in the process here on step four. Uh, once you've identified where the data comes from, what do you do? Well, you assess where you start from. This is what we call the baseline assessment. So this means you describe uh, this, the status of your pilot at the very beginning before anything, uh, for, before the implementation starts, to have something to benchmark your results against. And then we will ask you to report in several points in time. So here, actually, what, what you see are the reporting uh, times for after two years, after four years. I think Nikhil also introduced this before. Uh, so this basically shows um, uh, what you have achieved after, the, after a specific uh, uh, time of implementation. And what we would also like to ask you is to, to give an outlook at the, at the end of your project, what you think you will achieve in the future. And by the future, we mean in particular what you think you will have achieved by 2030, which is the, the year by when, uh, well, uh, the uh, net zero cities uh, 
partner cities should be should have become climate neutral. So therefore, we would like uh, to know at the end of the project, okay, do you think, still believe you will reach this your goal by 2030? You think you will maybe even reach it earlier? Or uh, are there some, at least some dimensions where you say, ah, okay, it will take a bit longer because we have learned from our, from our pilot, from our uh, other activities uh, that um, uh, this, well, we have such high barriers that uh, some uh, in, in a specific sector, climate neutrality will be climate neutrality will be achieved later. Next slide, please. Uh, so another slide. If not, uh, well, I think. Uh, uh, okay, I think I've already covered this. Yeah, this so. just shows more in detail what we will do in each of the dimensions. Uh, we. We will provide a guide that helps you to, uh, especially um, to, to ask the right questions. This is what you can see here on the right hand side. Um, these are questions uh, according to the eight steps that I've described. You know, um, for each of the domains of the monitoring, we will provide you with the guidance of what you should look at uh, in a qualitative way. And then later on at the next step, we will also provide you with more information on what, how this can be quantified. I think we can keep it. So keep it should I, I could click through? Yes, please. Yeah. The slides. I think we don't need to go through all of yeah. these dimensions. Uh, I've explained the logic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We will provide you with this uh, uh, in due course. Uh, it's part of a deliverable that is being uh, reviewed at the moment. And it leads to something like that here. Now, so we have uh, uh, several eight steps of monitoring. We have different impact domains related to the direct impacts, meaning reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, to the indirect impacts, meaning the co-benefits. And also, uh, we will provide you with the tools to, uh, to evaluate the progress uh, uh, along the, the impact pathways uh, and uh, along the, uh, well, in alliance, in, in coordination, in, in alignment with the levers of change that uh, are mentioned in the theory of change. Okay, and then the question is, okay, well, after all this data has been, has been collected, what will happen with it? Um, it will be visualized on the Net Zero Cities platform, yeah? So there will be a, an interface not only for reporting on progress, but there will be also an interface that will visualize uh, uh, some uh, very essential key indicators. Um, and uh, this is at the moment being developed. What you can see here on the right hand is a, is a, is a mock-up. Um, uh, what I think is very important to understand is that we will basically start from what is already there in terms of reporting platforms. Uh, we will link to the CDP and ICLE uh, reporting platforms with my covenant, and we will try to import uh, some of the data that is already there by an interface so to make uh, uh, work for you easier and to ensure that we don't do double accounting, but we, that we really use data that is already available on the platform. Yeah, that is actually uh, the current status of the development of the indicator framework. Uh, as we've just uh, discussed, uh, this should uh, facilitate the reporting on the pilots. No? You will be uh, provided with the structure and uh, an inventory of indicators that you can use uh, for your um, reporting uh, on the pilots. Uh, we use the same logic actually for the rep reporting on the climate uh, neutrality action plans. No? Uh, there will be, uh, I would say, uh, maybe different indicators to be applied, but the logic will be the same uh, to have a high degree of consistency and also to, to uh, avoid double work and to make uh, reporting for you as easy as possible. So I see a question uh, regarding the inventory. So it says, uh, when will the inventory of indicators be published? Um, the deadline for the deliverable is in March, no? so this is the time by when uh, uh, the indicators will be published. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, for I think for some key indicators, we might be able to give uh, some kind of a kind of a forecast, but the, the release date is March 2023. Right. This is a second one. Uh, regarding this interface, which will be linked to, to CDP uh, and ICLE, what mm -hmm. is the update frequency that is foreseen? Mm -hmm. 
That is a very good question. Um, uh, let me bring this into our uh, joint working group. We have one uh, between two work packages uh, working on, on uh, questions like this. Uh, uh, it's an important question indeed that we need to uh, need to clarify, and I will bring it to the technical committee to discuss it in detail. Right. And then uh, there's another one on GHE uh, regarding co-benefits for GHE. Do they just relate with the pilot activities or the overall city GHE reduction? Um. It, it depends, of course, on what you report on. Uh, as I said, the same logic applies to the to the reporting on the progress in the climate neutrality action plans, as well as from the pilots. Uh, it, it depends. It depends on uh, yeah what you actually look at. You know? um, uh, if if it is if you have a pilot project and you monitor your pilot project, I think it should be focused indeed on the on the uh, effects, on the uh, impacts of the pilot. Like this, in this case, I would not look at, the, look at the whole city, but it very much depends on how you define your pilot project. If you report on your climate neutrality action plan, I would look at the whole city. Right. And then there's a last one, again, relates to the, the climate city contracts. It says, just to clarify, the climate city contract monitoring will come on top of these eight levels of monitoring. As in, would, would CCC uh, monitoring be something that's additional uh, to these eight uh, steps? That's something additional. The CCC monitoring will look more at the document. It's a kind of a quality check for the document that you will, uh, I would say, uh, that the city signs at the beginning. Um, it, it, it is not about uh, reporting impacts. Uh, it is more about um, looking at well, which stakeholders are involved. Uh, was a resolution of the city council taken? Uh, what are the overarching objectives? But the CCC monitoring will not look at the progress made, yeah. and it will not be go so much into detail uh, like the, what I've just shown here. I uh, just suggest um, that we try to maybe just stay focused on the pilot here rather than bring in the CCC process. Mm, yeah. It's probably a bit confusing for those who aren't mission cities and right, yeah. mm. specifically about the pilot call itself. So will the remaining two questions, do you want to take a stab at them? Because I think it's about budgeting and the overall approach itself. Nikhil, I'm sorry, before we'll start, um, yeah. and I'm sorry for being off cam, there's a huge, really massive storm above my head. Everything is really unstable. But yesterday you mentioned something um, about us publishing earlier for diagrams um, um, as extracts from the framework. Um, Hans Martin kindly shared that the deliverable will be available in, only in March and we may need um, to share something during the application phase. So uh, could you please elaborate a little bit about that? When we can expect these four diagrams to be published? Thank you. As extracts from the framework. This question goes to Nihil or? Uh, or one of you, who, because. Who can answer uh, to that? OK, thank you. Um, well, I think it, we, of course, it needs to be available at the right uh, point in time, no? So uh, I think this is something we need to coordinate, um, uh, indeed, uh, between uh, the uh, work package working with the pilots and, and, and WP2, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is all, I think, homework for us. So uh, we will ensure that you will have the information you need. Uh, Excellent. And, and the, the, right the, the, in, the impact pathway diagrams on the six levers, uh, two of which would be with, which were included today. There are four others which we will include as a part of the the entire deck when we share with the, share those post session. Thank you so much. I think there are pending questions on on. So there's one last question, rather. Uh, on right, from I can take Juliet's question, if, if you like, Nicole, I think you're referring to that one. Um, so that's related to indicators. Will the selected cities have to provide final production at the end of the two years? And how will post-approval budget monitoring be conducted? Uh, so the exact framework for our monitoring and reporting is, um, is not yet um, finalized, and that will be 
all part of the, the grant agreement and um, uh, and will be shared with the selected cities mm. selection. Um, but there will, of course, be some form of uh, monitoring of budget and spend and the progress um, at an interim point and then, of course, the final point as well. But details mm. will be forthcoming. Uh, question. Think yeah, well, there's a, there will be a separate deliverable on the financial indicators now that is being prepared at the moment. Uh, and it will feed into what I've just presented. Yeah. Uh, deadline for this is uh, end of this month. Uh, I think we might need a round of coordination, but that uh, will be will be available earlier. So there are two open questions. I think uh, Will, do you want to? Yeah, I think that? um. So I'm thinking about Agni's question. Uh, Jana might take that one. She's okay. Um, I hope you can still hear me. Um. So on um, to the question, sorry for asking again, it is really possible to apply with a pilot only on governance co-creation aspects so that we don't have direct emissions reductions to report monitor. The answer was not clear for me. Um, so to, to this point, I'd say um, potentially uh, it means if the um, govern, if the barriers, if in a given domain or domains, the barrier to the uh, GAG emissions reduction is um, governance, is something that is not organized, that some, some, the blocker it lays within the governance mm. sphere, then yes, it would be possible because you could potentially assess the direct impact on uh, your um, GAG emission reduction if we remove that barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that depends very much on the on the call text for the uh, call for pilots. No, um, uh, as I remember, it it's uh, well asking for integrated solutions, and as I understood it, it uh, uh, there will be um, uh, some piece of technology involved. No. Uh, Therefore, I'm I'm not sure if it will be sufficient um, uh, to to look only at governance innovation, uh, but uh, it depends very much on whether the proposal is then approved or not. No? I mean, we will we will support with our systems, with our knowledge, with our KPIs, uh, any uh, any project approved. No? no doubt about that. So I think it's more a question of eligibility, which I cannot uh, and I do not want to answer here because I think that is. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, something you need to discuss with the uh, with uh, those uh, who uh, publish the call text uh, of drafted this. Just to add to that, there are some some specific questions in the call form um, that are asking about the the impact of the pilot activities and the mm -hmm. potential terms on the city's GHG emissions more broadly, yeah. and and specifying that. So it's not not the case that you would submit an application to the to the program without indicating what's the um, the impact on your city's emissions profiles in, in GHG emissions mm. in that but it's just that the approach that you take as Joanna was saying could be um, utilizing particular levers such as governance and other ones as well so it's more about as as, as has been said, what are the barriers to you achieving reductions in emissions across certain domains? And then how will you be then um, going about that and measuring that that is something that does and will happen? And this last one on the theoretical approach, I think, I don't know whether you will join or be better placed. I mean, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if this is specifically referring to um, MEL frameworks and impact logics or more broadly about the, the, the program. Um, I don't think we can pretend that, it, that this isn't very, very complicated and complex work and that it's incredibly challenged to take stakeholders with you on a journey that is not, um, that doesn't have deterministic outcomes or things that are controlled to a certain degree. But that is also something that we know is um, 
it's 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 a journey we're required to take um, in order to learn about how to actually overcome the the complex and um, reinforcing barriers that we actually face. So I'm not really sure I've got an answer to that question, uh, other than it is it is a dilemma and it is it is a tension. Um, but that is why we've oriented the the program and the call form very much towards what we feel cities will need to bring with them to this program in order to be able to catalyze change, which includes stakeholder engagement, it includes citizen engagement, it includes uh, governance, innovation, and regulate. It, it really is thinking about a whole range of levers. Um, and trying to build that sort of coalition for change. And the only thing I would add to that is, of course, you know, more, I, I would instead of theoretical call it methodical, uh, what we presented, of course, it, it gives uh, cities some, some guardrails and structures to work in, but you know, the content that they fit in is completely up to them. So, so the, the framing of, of what goes within the framework is completely open to interpretation and the city could make an argument uh, in, in, a, in a different direction and try and justify it as to why uh, it needs to be in a certain way that is very suited to the, the types of stakeholders uh, or a particular context for a city. And with that, I, I see we just have two minutes uh, to go. Uh, Will, do you want to have some, some final remarks or are we good to conclude? Um, I, th I think only just to, to say, um, as we mentioned before, that uh, the recordings, presentations will all be available and some already are on the website that I posted earlier. All of the guidance document is there, documentation is there. Um, please do reach out to us if you have questions um, at that email address. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, and to, to, to thank you, Nikhil and Hans Martin, um, for uh, your presentation and a very detailed um, and methodical approach to monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And thanks, everyone, for joining.